Greetings, CHP listeners all over the galaxy. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode. I've been thinking about the Kingdom of Cambodia a lot lately. And just the other day, I had this sudden inspiration to do something related to my favorite corner of the world. Hands down, the region of Southeast Asia. And the original intention of this episode was to focus on China-Cambodia relations since 1949. But I was thinking, since we're here, why not fly up, up and away in our beautiful balloon and get a quick survey of some of the marquee events from the history of China-Cambodian relations? They went back quite far, and though I didn't intend it in this part one episode, we'll focus on the ancient and the new, but not that new. And then next time in part two, we'll cover the history that most of us are at least vaguely familiar with, especially if you were reading newspapers back in the 1970s. So I'm thinking from introducing some old with the new, when this is all over, it'll be a nice, nutritious, well-balanced presentation that you could stash away in your ever-growing reservoir of accumulated knowledge. Unlike Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar, Cambodia didn't share a common border with China, so their history wasn't as intimate. There were periods of Cambodian history when there was more interaction with China than at other times, but... Geography was somewhat of a limiting factor. Despite the matter of distance, most of what we know about early Cambodian history comes courtesy of China's historians from past imperial dynasties. Like many, but not all, of these peoples rimming the Chinese nation on three sides, very little survives in their own languages that offers insight into their earliest history, as told by their historians. The Khmer Empire, that I'm sure most of you have heard of, during its most flourishing decades, when Angkor was the largest and among the most spectacular urban areas in the world, they called themselves in their kingdom Kampucha, from which we get the word Cambodia. In Mandarin, Cambodia is called Chai. Like other great civilizations in Asia, the Khmer people developed along a river. China had the Yellow River and the Yangtze. In India, it was the Indus. Vietnam had the Red River. For Cambodia, it was the Mekong River, where life-giving water allowed people in great numbers to thrive. Before the Khmer Empire of 802 to 1431 were the kingdoms of Funan and Junla. And if not for the official Chinese histories, we might not know as much about those places as we do. Funan... That's how the Chinese chroniclers referred to this place that the locals called Panam, which meant mountain. The earliest incarnation of what would later on become the country of Cambodia lasted from the 1st to the 6th centuries, having its most prosperous age around the 4th century. This is A.D. Funan was located around the Mekong River Delta and at its height stretched across parts of Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, and Laos, with its capital near the present location of Phnom Penh. When Funan was at its most powerful, from the 200s to the 500s, they were the most dominant power in Southeast Asia. Some historians consider Funan to be the first city-state in Southeast Asia. Well, that may very well be, but you know how it is this far back. What little we know comes from the Chinese, and not until Zhou Daguan's eyewitness descriptions of Cambodia in the late 13th century do we get any reliable insight into the place. And we'll get to Zhou Daguan in a bit. Sun Quan, the emperor of Eastern Wu during the Three Kingdoms period, may recall from the Taiwan series was one of the earliest rulers to send out some scouts to go see what was out there, east of Fujian, across the strait. Well, he did the same thing to the south. According to the Liangshu, the Book of Liang, in the year 240, Sun Quan sent out two envoys named Kang Tai and Zhu Ying to this place they called Funan. Kang Tai wrote about this place in his travelogue, Wu Shi Wai Guo Zhuan, a count of foreign states in the time of Wu, they gave a reliable account of what they observed in Funan, remarking on the advanced society they seemed to have with buildings, palaces, and temples. He also remarked that their script appeared to be an Indianized form of writing. They saw Funan when it was experiencing its glory days. 
Funan wasn't a kingdom in the true sense. Like their next-door neighbors in the east, the Chams, and their political entity called Champa, these people in Funan were a collection of political entities all loosely joined together. Funan's power all came from their plum location on the trade routes between China and India. All of this earliest South Seas maritime trade going on usually didn't stray too far from the coasts. They were still relying on celestial navigation and coastal landmarks to get to where they were going to. And because of this, Funan had a nice location right at the bottom of modern-day Vietnam. There's no records of any Chinese settlements in Funan. It was purely a place for trade or to replenish supplies for those ships sailing in between the most ancient ports of India and Southeast Asia. Funan's culture is called an Indianized culture. That is, they received their earliest influences from the direction of India. The Hinduism, writing script, and the ways they ordered their society came from the West. And those sailors from India... They figured out very early how to cross the Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea, portage across the skinny part of the Malay Peninsula to the other side on the Gulf of Thailand. And once there, they had ready access to all the emerging ports of the entire Southeast Asian region, including Funan. There were three embassies from Funan to China during the Western Jin, 268, 286, and 287. This was during the 36-year reign of the Jin Dynasty founder, Emperor Wu, also remembered as Sima Yen. It was only a two-week voyage from Funan to Guangzhou, but beginning around the time of the Jin Dynasty in China, mariners were starting to become a lot more bolder than they had once been. The observations and discoveries in astronomy, better sailing vessels, and trial and error opened up all of the emerging trading entrepots of Southeast Asia, including the many islands of modern Indonesia. This greatly diminished the importance of Funan as a place to trade. After maritime traders dared to stray from the safety and reliability of the coasts, they expanded their networks and called on Funan less and less. And between the demise of Funan's economic prospects coupled with terrible internal power struggles between opposing factions, it slowly led to the end of Funan. As they weakened, they were given the squeeze by their neighbors to the north in Jianla and to the east from the Chams in their Linyi kingdom. By the way, a lot of this material was already mentioned in that six-part series on China-Vietnam relations. Jianla was the next phase of Cambodian history. Like with Funan, Jun La was the Chinese name for which this kingdom was remembered. Also like Funan, Jun La probably wasn't a kingdom and was divided up into a number of political entities who were recognized by the Chinese, at least, as one kingdom. Though once a vassal state, they were credited with putting an end to Funan, and in so doing, Jun La became the next power in the future Cambodia. Mind you, almost everything that has come down to us from these pre-Angkorian times, this period of Cambodian history that came before the Khmer Empire and their capital city of Angkor, historians, scientists, and every other ologist disagrees on quite a bit. We're as much in the dark about Jan La as we are with other pre-Angkorian history. If not for Chinese travelers and historians writing this stuff down, we'd know even less. Tang Dynasty historians mention tribute missions from Jun La to the Tang Imperial Court. Late in the Tang Dynasty, during the De Zong Emperor in 802, the Angkor or Khmer period began. This year of 802 is sometimes called the traditional start date for the history of the Cambodian or Khmer people. At its height, the Khmer Empire ruled over all of Cambodia, parts of modern-day Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. Jayavarman II was the founder of the Khmer Empire. There were nine kings who would follow between Jayavarman in the early 9th century to the 9th Jayavarman, who is counted as the final Khmer ruler in 1431. So the Khmer Empire ran concurrently with the Tang, the Song, Yuan, and lasted all the way up to the early Ming, 
Jayavarman II is remembered as the uniter of all the individual kingdoms into one single Khmer state. And he reigned from 802, when the Khmer state was founded, up to 850. Early 9th century, Champa, to the east, was still enjoying its time as the strongest and most vibrant regional power. Ancient inscriptions mention that Jayavarman liberated Cambodia from a place called Java. Now, whether this was Champa or the Javan Shalendra dynasty, we can only speculate. Much has been uncovered from these earliest times, but researchers and archaeologists are still unsure of what they've found. Jayavarman II was the first of these Khmer god kings to rule there. We remember him mostly as the founding ruler of Angkor, or capital city, on the north banks of the Tonle Sap, the largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. The golden age of Khmer civilization occurred under their greatest king, Suryavarman II. He's mostly remembered as the builder of Angkor Wat, constructed from over 10 million sandstone blocks, each weighing more than one to one and a half tons each. This architectural wonder of the world was built between 1113 and 1175, years that in China we can hardly ever forget, the reign of Hui Zong and his ignoble end and the fall of the northern Song and the start of the southern Song, while the Zhao family and their Song dynasty were enduring those traumatic decades in the 12th century. Angkor Wat, one of the most recognizable structures on our planet, was under construction. Civil wars and invasions hastened the decline of the Khmer Empire, but there would be one more rise to glory during the reign of Cambodia's King Jayavarman VII. Unlike most previous rulers and Khmer elites, he was not a Hindu. His legendary story tells of a pacifist prince living in exile, leaving his brother to rule in Angkor. And under his brother's rule, the Khmer Empire had been wracked with infighting and chaos. And then legend tells of this exiled prince, Jayavarman VII, returning to his Khmer lands to rescue the country from the invading forces of Champa. And the future Jayavarman VII returned to his native Cambodia, arriving in the capital in 1181, where he was made the new king. And then with his homeland and ruins and the Champa army still stressing out the Khmer populace, the pacifist Jayavarman VII put together a formidable army that engaged the Champa military and expelled them from Khmer lands. And in an act of revenge, Jayavarman VII led his army straight to the Champa capital of Vijaya and sacked the city. And in a stark reversal of fortune, Champa was absorbed for a while into the Khmer Empire. Angkor rose from the ruins to become one of the greatest cities in the world in its awe-inspiring scale, complexity, and architectural greatness. Jayavarman VII also built Angkor Thom, which literally means great capital city. It was constructed in a perfect square shape, three kilometers long on each of its sides. During Jayavarman VII's reign, another vast and complex infrastructure program was instituted that did much to connect all the major towns in the empire by roads. Today it's all in ruins, but During this stretch of the Khmer Empire, it was quite a sight to behold, I'm sure. He wasn't the first Buddhist king of Cambodia, but he was the first one to declare Buddhism as the official state religion. He originally followed the Mahayana sect of Buddhism. Little by little, the Hindu look and feel of the empire was slowly transformed into a more Buddhist appearance. Buddhism had always been around and had mainly been embraced by the masses of people. But as I just mentioned, the upper classes and nobles usually stuck with their Hindu gods. So late 12th, early 13th century, that was all changing. Jayavarman VII also built the Bayon Buddhist temple complex adjacent to Angkor Wat. In the decades following Jayavarman VII's death in 1218, at almost 100 years of age, succeeding kings went back and forth between Buddhism and Hinduism. And this capriciousness with respect to all important spiritual matters, it kind of diminished the esteem the people had for their Khmer royalty. 
What came about in the end was a rejection of Mahayana Buddhism and a full-throated embrace of the Theravada Buddhism that was practiced in the Thai Ayutthaya kingdom. Let's jump to the year 1279 and the founding of the Mongol Yuan Dynasty in China. Where China-Cambodia relations are concerned, here's where things really begin to happen. As the old philosophical thought experiment goes, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make any sound? Well, if there were no records of any Chinese settlements or significant presence until the 13th century, were there any Chinese settlements at all in Cambodia? Well, how can there not have been? Nanhai, or South Sea's maritime trade, went back to the Bronze Age in China. Just because some sailor or merchant who went from Guangdong to Cambodia didn't write a detailed record of his travels doesn't mean there wasn't a nascent Chinese community that settled there. It's generally agreed up to this time in the late 13th century, there was still no significant Chinese community that had yet to take hold. There were plenty of Chinese who came and went. In the Bob reliefs of Angkor Thom, there's some indication of a Chinese presence. But there was one Chinese who visited during the Yuan Dynasty who left us what is considered to be the definitive account of daily life in the Khmer Empire in the late 13th century. This was Zhou Daguan. He was included in an embassy sent in 1296 from the court of Temur Khan, a.k.a. Yuan Emperor Changzong, grandson to Kublai Khan. Zhou's book, Zhan La Feng Tu Ji, or The Customs of Cambodia, provided all kinds of insight and descriptions of late 13th century Cambodia, or Zhan La, as the Chinese still called the place. In this work, Zhou Da Guan mentions a myriad of details about the city of Angkor and all its most famous monuments and temples. He wrote how opulent and awe-inspiring it was to see the scale and design of this capital city of the Khmer Empire. Those of you who have been to Siem Reap and beheld the ruins of Angkor Wat might be able to appreciate what Zhou Da Guan got to witness with his own eyes. The temple complex had only been completed about a century before he got there. Angkor Thom was practically still brand new. Zhou Da Guan arrived in Angkor in August of 1296, a year after King Indravarman III made Theravada Buddhism the state religion. It was only about a 16-day sailing from Wenzhou to the Mekong Delta. From there, it was a 10-day cruise up the Mekong to the Ton Le Sap. And he got there in August 1296 and stayed for 11 months. In his book, Jan La Feng Tu Ji, A Record of Cambodia, he described everything that one might run into in late 13th century Angkor. The layout of the buildings and the temples, the people, their garments, the rituals he saw, the carvings he described, the Theravada Buddhism they practiced, and the dominant role of the Buddhist clergy in government. After his long stint, Zhou Daguan went back to China in 1297, and thankfully his book managed to last through the many upheavals in China between his day and the modern age. He noticed there were Chinese merchants already present in Angkor, but as far as a real Chinese community like he might have encountered in Ayutthaya or Dai Viet, uh, he didn't see anything. And if you'd like to read a translated version of these downright fantastical descriptions of what he saw over the 10 months he was present in Cambodia, there's a book you can read. Translator and author Peter Harris, senior fellow in the China Research Center at Victoria University of Wellington, came out with a wonderful translation of Zhou Da Guan's book, and it was a real eye-opener. I'll have a link to the book at the show notes. Well, not that much longer after Zhou's return to China, Khmer society began its demise, falling from its former glory and greatness. There were no further grandiose building or infrastructure projects, and with the cessation of all these building projects— all the knowledge gleaned about their society and history from the study of the stone carvings just disappeared. And there was no further record that could explain the history that transpired in the Khmer Empire in the 14th century. 
Thanks to the aggressiveness of Cambodia's two neighbors of Ayutthaya to the west and Dai Viet to the east, the Khmer Empire remained under a constant state of stress. This was a recurring theme of all the histories of Southeast Asia. Of the six major historical polities of the Burmese, Thais, Laotians, Cambodian, Champa, and Vietnamese, in all the various political incarnations, all of the kingdoms and governments, each one enjoyed its periods of hegemony and occupation by one or another regional neighbor. Starting from the time of Zhou Daguan's visit in 1296 and Marco Polo's return to Venice two years earlier in 1294, after 24 years in China, trade all around the region, and of course in China, began to pick up the pace. Then, during Admiral Zheng He's voyages to Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the Middle East between 1405 and 1433, Cambodia was one of his stops. He stopped off in present-day Sihanoukville in the inaugural voyage of 1405. He came back a second time in 1411, this time to the port in Kampot. And each time, the Khmer king would meet with Zheng He personally. And these missions were important for the diplomacy between China and Cambodia. The Yongle emperor placed a lot of importance on these tribute missions led by Zheng He. There was a third voyage in 1431, and there may have been others, but nothing was recorded beyond these three. Zheng He's voyages were significant because they helped to establish closer trade links and diplomatic relations between China and many other countries, including Cambodia. His expeditions were also important for spreading Chinese culture and influence throughout the region. Today, we might call these famous voyages of Zheng He an exercise in Chinese soft power. Early in the Ming Dynasty, a greatly diminished Khmer Empire fell to the Thai forces of Ayutthaya and a series of Puppet kings were put on the throne until the end came in 1431. Ayutthaya forces came in and plundered the city, looting this once most magnificent city in this part of the world, leaving it to the banyan trees and other natural forces that slowly consumed what was left of it. The Kambuja people, they left Angkor amidst the destruction and migrated south, reconstituting themselves in a number of capital cities in and around modern-day Phnom Penh, the city founded in 1434, again right after the fall of the Khmer Empire. This is where Cambodia went from a rich, self-supporting agrarian society to one totally dependent on foreign trade to survive. And right here in the mid-15th century, especially in the wake of Zheng He's voyages, a permanent Chinese settlement starts to form in Cambodia. And not just Chinese, there were also Japanese, Malay, Thai, and other traders from the Indianized parts of Southeast Asia. Phnom Penh existed for trade, and it thrived due to its very choice location right on the Mekong River, as well as three other rivers that intersected with the Mekong. By the time of the last voyage of Zheng He, the Khmer Empire had been vanquished, And this period that follows is called post-Angkor Cambodia, 1431 to 1863. This was a period of Thai and Vietnamese influence on Cambodia. And by the early 1800s, so far had Cambodia fallen politically, it was placed under joint suzerainty of both countries, causing Cambodia to no longer exist as a sovereign state. For a number of reasons... Cambodia-China relations up to now had been cordial throughout the ups and downs of each nation's fortunes. China and Cambodia, from the Funan Kingdom through the centuries, carried out diplomatic relations. But now, things were about to get a lot more exciting as we enter the 1800s. I'd like to turn to more recent times. There was an important blip on the Chinese-Cambodian radar that happened with the establishment of the Principality of Ha Tin, or He Xian in Mandarin. In the late 17th century, there was a Chinese named Mo Jiu, who's referred to in most history books as Ma Gu. He originally came from western Guangdong and established this city of Ha Tin right on the border of Cambodia and Vietnam. He was responsible for attracting a 
big wave of Chinese immigration to Cambodia following the fall of the Ming Dynasty in 1644. He himself was a Ming exile who gave up on China after the establishment of the Qing, the Nguyen lords who controlled parts of central and southern Vietnam up to the Cambodian border, sometimes referred to as Cochin China. They granted Mak Gu this land in Ha Tin that throughout history had been considered within Khmer borders. Actually, throughout most of history, the Mekong Delta had been populated by Khmer people. So with the support of the ruling Nguyen's and this land grant, Mak Gu welcomed 3,000 southern Ming loyalists who were fleeing China in the 1670s thanks to the Kangxi Emperor's successful efforts at putting down the revolt of the three feudatories in southern China. Because Maku's ancestral home was on the Leizhou Peninsula of Guangdong, the greatest number of immigrants to Ha Tin were Hainanese, just across the Qiongzhou Strait that separated Hainan Island from Guangdong. So these Ming loyalists who migrated to Cambodia after 1644 and the waves of Cantonese and Hainanese who came to the Mak family controlled Ha Tin became the first significant Chinese community in Cambodia. There at Ha Tin, the Maks transformed the place into a very large and prosperous semi autonomous trading port run by ethnic Chinese. It's still there today, right on the Vietnam side of the border with Cambodia, though it's not as bustling as it once was in the 17th and 18th century. During the Qianlong Emperor's reign in China, Ha Tin enjoyed its golden age. Because of the rapid growth of Chaolan, the Chinese district of Saigon, most of the regional trade tended to happen there. And because Cantonese made up the largest single linguistic group in Chaolan, that became the lingua franca of Indochina trade, including in Phnom Penh. With more and more Vietnamese encroachment into Khmer lands, especially during the 1800s, it led to quite a bit of violence. And so helpless had Cambodia's rulers become in the face of the aggression from Thailand and Vietnam, it got so bad that the ruler of Cambodia had to call in the French. Well, he reached out to the British first, but they turned him down. For most people of my generation and the one before... One name rises above all else as the face of modern Cambodian history. This, of course, is the late king, Noradam Sayunak. I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't know that name. Now, we'll get to him later. He's going to be one of the major stars of part two of this series. Before we get to him, let's start by going back to Noradam Sayunak's great-great-grandfather, Ang Dung. He was the king of Cambodia from 1841 to 1860. It was Ang Dung who, recognizing the helplessness of his country at this time in history, paved the way for his eldest son and successor, King Norodom, to sign the country's fade away to the French on August 11th, 1863. And from that point forward, we have the Protectorate Francais de Cambodge. So this progenitor of the Cambodian royal house of Noradom is remembered not only as the longest reigning monarch in Cambodian history, 1860 to 1904, but also as the one who made that bargain with the French, surrendering control of Cambodia to France's Indochine enterprise that would take shape in 1884 when French forces were able to lump together Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. French written accounts of Phnom Penh suggest by the mid-19th century, at least, that city was primarily inhabited by ethnic Chinese and seemed to exist only for trade. Once they get settled in Cambodia, French archaeologists had a field day rediscovering and restoring the old temples and palaces from the Angkor period. Angkor Wat had been reclaimed by the jungle since the fall of the city in the 15th century, It was still visible, one could see it if they looked for it, and the temple ruins were often visited. In 1860, naturalist and explorer Henri Mouot had stumbled upon Angkor Wat, and thanks to his and other scientists' research and exploration, there was an explosion of new information about Khmer civilization. And thanks to Mouot, this globally recognized UNESCO heritage site, Angkor Wat, 
became an object of fascination that has drawn scholars and tourists from all over the world. And so much is it appreciated by people of the nation. It appears on every Cambodian flag going back hundreds of years. The French took stock of the situation and did what seemed to come natural to other governments in the 19th century, including in the U.S., they began taxing and soaking the ethnic Chinese. Nothing oppressive, just a number of taxes reserved only for them. To control the Chinese Cambodians, the French established five associations based on the five main linguistic groups of Dioju, Hakka, Hokkien, Hainanese, and Cantonese. Whichever one you belong to, you had to register with them. The heads of these five associations negotiated with the French on behalf of their constituents. King Naradam was succeeded by his half-brother, Sesowat. Here, from 1904 to 1927, the French really planted some deep roots in Cambodia. They took full advantage of controlling malleable kings who had no more power than any puppet ruler. Sesowat was succeeded by his son, Sesowat Manivang, the grandfather to Noradam Seonuk. One thing of note, during Sesowat Manivang's rule from 1927 to 1941, communism was introduced to Cambodia. Ho Chi Minh had founded the Indo-Chinese Communist Party in 1930. This kind of ideology immediately found favor among many Cambodians who had been desperate to get rid of the French ever since the day they arrived. The introduction of communism is going to have rather profound and catastrophic consequences later on in Cambodian history. As interesting as this time was for Cambodian history, I hope you don't mind that I'm not drilling down too deep on the Khmer history and trying to focus more on relations with China and Chinese Cambodians. Next time, we're going to look at the 1960s and 70s and all the madness of that period in Southeast Asia. So I'd like to quickly bring things up to that point before I bring down the curtain. In 1941, Japan invaded Cambodia, which at that time, just like in Casablanca, was under the control of the Vichy French government. They were allowed to manage the administration until the end of the war came in March 1945 when the French were tossed out by the Japanese. But as we all know, they came back after World War II and resumed their previous roles as colonial masters. One other extremely consequential thing happened in 1941. Cambodian king Sesawat Manivang died in April of that year, and the one selected to succeed the king as the new puppet on the throne was Sesawat Manivang's grandson, Noradam Seonuk. Seonuk's mother was the daughter of the recently departed king of Cambodia. The French thought they had another easy-to-manipulate puppet under their control, but as we'll see, this particular Cambodian royal was very adept at playing his limited hand quite well. We'll look at Nora Dum Seonuk next time. He was very tight with Zhou Enlai. Like overseas Chinese anywhere in the world, the Chinese Cambodians had to be careful to bend with the political winds, whichever way they blew. No matter surrendering their wealth, paying arbitrary taxes, making concessions to avoid potential violence, and always banding together in their groups and associations for safety when the going got rough. In 1949, after the communists had prevailed in the Chinese Civil War, there were quite a lot of outbursts of patriotism all over the world from many Chinese communities. This was particularly so in Phnom Penh. Such were the outbursts of patriotic display among the Chinese community there. Seonuk had to get Premier Zhou on the phone and ask him to talk to the community leaders there and ask them to cool it. In June of 1952, Seonuk was able to take control of the government in Cambodia, and in 1953, it was all over for France and Cambodia, and the country became independent. And for a short while, not for long, unfortunately... Cambodia enjoyed a few nice years of peace and economic prosperity, like Beirut in the mid-50s and 60s, or Shanghai in the 1920s. Regrettably, in all three cases, the peace wasn't meant to last. In fact, in that very year, 1953, a Khmer named Saloth Sar returned to his Cambodian homeland and started teaching at a local Phnom Penh high school. 
like other Asian revolutionaries of the 20th century. Salotsar had spent a long time in France and learned the ins and outs of communism. As much as he loved his native Cambodia, well, that's how much he hated Vietnam. From day one, Sayonok had to deal with threats to his rule. Communists throughout Southeast Asia were energized by Mao's great victory in 1949. There was a feeling that swept all through East Asia that what happened in China was only the beginning. The United States felt the same way, and that's how we got President Eisenhower's domino theory. In Cambodia, the communists, who Noradam Sayana called the Khmer Rouge, began to grow in numbers and in strength. And after a deadly game of cat and mouse between the Cambodian government forces and communists, Salosar, now one of the leaders of the Khmer Rouge, disappeared into the mountains and jungles of eastern Cambodia to train and prepare. In 1965, Salosar will take a trip to China, and it's going to be there where we will pick up next time. This is only going to be a two-parter, so don't worry. More Salosar next episode, along with Noradam Sayanuk, Lan No, Zhou Enlai, Mao Zedong, the Gang of Four, Nixon. When I say you won't want to miss this one, I mean it, Pete. So mark that one in your calendar. In this episode, I just wanted to go over all the earlier events in Cambodian history and the country's relations with China. Because the two countries didn't share a border, the Cambodians didn't have the same experience as their Vietnamese neighbors who had China right on their northern border and had already suffered through four periods of domination under China's thumb, going back to the Han Dynasty. But many a Cambodian saw themselves as the very same victims of the Vietnamese, who, in turn, viewed themselves as victims of their northern neighbor. Plenty of all that coming up in part two. So, until the next time... This here's Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Santa Monica, California this time. Wishing you my very best, and I hope you'll come back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.